out in the wild, beehives turn their queens over every two, three, four years, depending on how well mated the queen was and how long she lasts. In the beekeeping world, we want to produce new queens to requeen hives that have got older queens or to make new hives or to fix hives where something's happened to the queen. By the way, the most common thing that can happen to a queen in a beehive is the beekeeper. More, more queens that die, die because of beekeepers than any other reason, is, uh, I, I believe. So, in order to make the bees make a queen, we have to first understand the biology and the process behind how bees make queens and under what circumstances they'll make queens. Bees can make any egg into a queen cell by feeding the larva nothing but royal jelly. It's useful to look at the uh, lifespan of a queen cell. That is the time from when a queen is an egg through to when she emerges from the cell after 16 days. So it takes a queen 16 days to emerge, it takes a worker bee 21 days to emerge, and it takes a drone 24 days to emerge. During that 16 days for the queen, three days are spent as an egg, and then days four through to eight are spent as a larva, and the rest of the time the queen is in a capped cell. If you're interested in queen rearing, you can get one of these charts easily enough. This, one, this is one that I just downloaded free off the internet, printed on my colour printer and stuck to a piece of cardboard. But you can buy them uh, from the bee supply shops. And that sets out all of the days that the uh, queen spends in each phase during her development and a lot of other useful information. When the bees are making a queen at their leisure, so that would be in a situation like uh, a super seizure or a swarm cell situation where there's an existing queen in the hive laying eggs and the bees decide to make new queens, they start by picking a larva that's exactly the right age, about day four. And if you look back up here, you'll realize that the amount of time that that larva is going to be fed royal jelly is actually quite short. It's only five days. Now that's really crucial when it comes to rearing good queens because the other way that a hive can make queen, can be induced to make queen cells is if they are put into an emergency situation where they're making emergency cells. Now that you can make a hive you can go into that state simply by taking the queen away. If you do a split where you take brood out of a one hive and put it into another hive and let them make their own queen, that queen will be produced from emergency cells. Now those queens may not be as good as queens where, that are made from the other two methods, that's super seizure or swarm. And the reason for that is that when a hive becomes queenless, they have, the clock starts ticking at that point. They have literally three days to get queen cells underway. Because after that, there are no eggs, or more particularly four day old larva left in the hive. So they get into a little bit of panic mode and sometimes they will make cells, they will make queen cells, start feeding larva that are older than four days. Now because, imagine that they pick a five day old larva, that means it gets fed from day five through to day eight, compared to day four or to day eight. That's actually quite a big difference in the amount of uh, royal jelly that that queen cell gets fed 
and the amount of royal jelly that the queen cell gets fed in turn determines how well developed the queen is and in particular how well developed her reproductive organs are before she goes off and gets mated. There's still a lot of other factors that determine whether she's going to be a good queen or not, but uh, that's a very critical factor. Now, uh, it is possible to use the emergency cell method to make queens. Uh, if, if I was a hobby beekeeper and I had two hives and one of them went queenless and it failed to produce a new queen, I would use the emergency cell method to get that hive going again because a poor queen is better than no queen by a long way. You can also, if you understand the timing in that picture up there, you can uh, come back in after you've, made, after you've set up the, the hive that's making the emergency cells and find if you go in at the right moment in time, and you can work it out from that chart, you'll find some of the cells in, some of the emergency cells are capped and some of them aren't. The capped ones are the ones that were made from larva that were a little bit older. And they're going to be the ones that emerge first and run around the hive and kill the rest. So you don't want those ones. So if you go in at the right moment when the oldest ones are capped and the younger ones are still uncapped and take down all of the capped ones, then using the emergency cell method can produce queens just as good as any other method. When you're grafting, what you want to do is create an environment where the bees are not only queenless, but they're hopelessly queenless. What's the difference? Queenless hive is, is exactly as the words imply has no queen in it. There's no queen pheromone and the bees know that they need to produce a new, uh, a new queen. A, a hive that is hopelessly queenless not only has no queen, but it has no eggs or larva that are young enough for it to produce queen cells. So the process that I'm going to describe as to how I make my bees make queens involves first creating a hopelessly queenless hive. Being hopelessly queenless on its own isn't enough. You have to have a hive which has a lot of nurse bees in it. It has to be pretty much overcrowded. It has to be well fed. And if you create all of those environment correctly, and it has to, because it's hopelessly queenless, that means there are no eggs or young larva in that hive. Then when you do a graft and drop newly grafted larva into that hive, those bees will pounce on them and build them out into beautiful queen cells. Now what you've done in that situation is you have created a hive that is desperately in need of a queen and therefore will produce lots of queen cells. So you're taking advantage of the emergency cell instinct. What you then do is you, and that only, that only takes 24 hours. Then what you do, once the, they've started making those queen cells, is you can move those cells into a queen right environment, provided the queen can't get to them. So for instance, in a, uh, what we call a finisher hive. So the hive that I just described before, which was in that desperately, uh, hopelessly queenless status, that's often referred to as a starter hive. Once they've started drawing out those cells, you can then take them and put them into a, another hive, which is queen right, but which where the queen is, say, in the bottom of a double deep uh, two brood box hive, and the queen's in the bottom, and there's a queen excluder, and the cells are on the top. You can't put those cells into a hive with, into a queen right hive, where the queen can access them because she'll just go and tear them all down. And that's a really important point because also later on in the process, if one of those cells emerges into that top box before the rest have, she'll run around and tear them down too. Ask me how I know. <laughs> so you'll hear people talking about a starter hive and a finisher hive. In my next video, 
actually in video three, I'm going to be, or part three of this series, I'm going to be describing how I use what we call a, a cloak board in order to achieve all of that, everything that I've just described inside one hive without having to move the queen cells from one hive to another. And that hive remains queen right throughout, but the bees, the cloak board makes the bees in the top box think that they're hopelessly queenless. We'll come back to that in part three. So just to run over that again, to make a hive make queens, it needs to be hopelessly queenless and it needs to be well fed, it needs to have lots of bees in it and it needs to be overcrowded or feel overcrowded. Those are the conditions that will produce the best queen cells. The good thing about queen rearing is that you get to choose the genetics that you, where you produce, that you produce queens from. And also, if you're queen rearing from your own bees and you've chosen eggs or larva from a, a hive that is doing well in, your, in the way you run bees, then you're selecting the genetics that are going to do well in your area. Which, uh, so in fact, I think that the queens that you make yourself will be every, can be, have the potential to be every bit as good as any queen that you can buy. And significantly better than queens you buy, which unbeknown to you come from a thousand kilometers away and a different, that have uh, been bred to perform in a different climate. So local, if you are buying queens, buy them local. I'm not going to go into uh, a discussion about the pros and cons of things like artificial insemination. The queen rearing that I do and that I'm outlining in this, these, this series of videos is uh, all my queens, uh, all my breeder queens, uh, queens that I've selected from my bees because they're performing well and they exhibit the traits that I'm looking for and they are all open mated. So if producing queens is something you're interested in, follow along this series of videos and you might pick something up. But remember, this is not a how-to video, this is how I do it. Thanks for watching.